Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and happy Friday. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. We talked about Frank Duvenek Mm -hmm. and Lizzie Boot this week. Mm Mm-hmm. Which I really, really like so many things about both of them. (laughs) Um, One thing we didn't get into, I mean, we touch on their relationships a little bit. Lizzie was the inspiration for a lot of Henry James. Like, if you have read Portrait of a Lady or The Golden Bowl, they are inspired directly by her and her family. Um, There are a lot of pieces. Like I said, much theorizing about whether or not he was in love with her and couldn't quite admit it to himself. There's a fun story about Frank Duvenek and Whistler in Italy. Okay. They started hanging out a lot and kind of drawing together a lot. And then there were arguments about whether one or the other had plagiarized from the other. Mm -hmm. And the funny part is that Duvenek kind of didn't care. Like, he was so unbothered by stuff like that. He's like, well, I know what my (laughs) art is. It's fine. I oh I admire that uh, that approach to life. I think I think he sounds like more fun than you think he sounds like. <laughs> I well I thought all the part about being so encouraging of uh other students and um you know being recognized as kind the the parts about like hiding under the table to make animal I was like I would I be bothered if I were one of the people at the table and a person was, like, making a fake argument? (laughs) I mean, I think to keep it in mind, it's, like, at a place that is probably very loud. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? It's not like you're having a quiet meal with a friend and there's a dude under your table barking. (laughs) Like, it's a little more like he's adding to the the audio drama that plays out in a restaurant and trying Uh to, like make it more interesting. I, he sounds fun as heck to me. Um, I will drink with you any day, Frank Duvenek. Um, that is also another thing we didn't talk about a whole lot. We talked about how uh, her father and Henry James did not think he was refined enough for her. But there was a lot of like, this kid from a beer garden thinks he can marry my society daughter. Sure. Like there's a lot of that going on. And he was really unassuming I think one of the things that's most fascinating and speaks the most about him is that, you know, he was a really good art teacher. He was really, really wonderful at supporting other artists. And a lot of those students who, like, would follow him to the ends of the earth Mm -hmm. were not much younger than him. Like, in some cases, like, a year or two. They were more like peers, but he was so ahead of them in terms of talent and skill and ability to, like, work with people, that he was the natural leader of that scene, which Mm -hmm. is kind of cool. Um, (laughs) I like him. Uh, He, one of the things we also didn't talk about that kind of um, helps knit together the historical fabric uh, and where people touch up together is that he was um, very influenced by previous podcast subject, Gustave Courbet, um, who was really, he learned about through his, one of his teachers, Wilhelm uh, Liebel, who kind of was part of the German realist movement that was really into Courbet at that time. I just like it. Yeah. Um, Another thing we didn't talk about, but I love, is there are three paintings of essentially the same thing that he did as a project with William Merritt Chase, who was one of his close friends in art school. Chase was the one who got sick when they were traveling in Venice and then got a job back in the U.S. Um, But the two of them did this cool project where they did um, paintings. It's sometimes called just Turkish page. And it's like a little boy who is in like Turkish garb. He has a little head wrap and he's, uh, you know, kind of dressed very simply and he's seated and there's, you know, animals around him and stuff and food. And they each painted this same scene, which was interesting because they're very different, right? Mm-hmm. Like Frank's version of it, the page looks very skinny and really much more um, kind of dramatically 
run down, for lack of better phrasing, whereas Chase's is almost lush. It's a really beautiful painting. But then there's a third painting that William Merritt Chase painted, which is Duvenek painting his version of the painting. (laughs) And when you look at the three of them together, there's something so weird and wonderful and delightful that these two painters were like, I have a cool and weird idea. Yeah. (laughs) Let's make a project together. Um, It's interesting because it's a really good way to look at how different painters of the time were interpreting things differently and it's a a really good lesson for people that that are maybe not maybe not confident that they can pick out differences in art to be like yes you can look at these two right together Mm -hmm. of the same thing and how differently they express it um i love it i I love art did you know i am (laughs) i i think i gathered that Uh um here is a thing that boils my blood okay There are a lot of biographies of Frank Duvenek that say he married one of his students. That, one, makes it sound a little seedy, like he Mm -hmm. married Mm -hmm. someone much younger than him that was, you know, that there was a power imbalance that does Mm -hmm. happen when people have a relationship with with students. But, like, not only does it make him sound like a creeper when that wasn't what was going on, but it also makes Lizzie not an active participant when she clearly pursued him. Right. <laughs> and it's like, no, she was actually older than him. Yeah. She kind of had all the power because she had money and social status and he did not. Yeah. And I, so I'm always like, I hate when it gets simplified that way. It's like, that's not really, you're not really conveying that this was pr- a pretty equal partnership in terms of like. Right two people actually wanting to be together. Um, It is very, I really, really like Lizzie's take on things that she's like, I didn't think I was ever going to get married. This is weird. Yeah, (laughs) I understand that. Yeah, I have a husband and a baby inside of a year. I don't know how that happened. I mean, she does, but it's like, whoops. Yeah, when, when Patrick and I met, I had been, I will describe it as like aggressively single for like five years. And I had been in a relationship before that for a couple years. And then the years before that was like another period of being, again, ag- aggressively single. <laughs> I was sort of being like, how'd this happen? I, I get that. Yeah. We, we didn't have any babies, though. Same, same. I didn't think I ever wanted to get married. And then I met Brian and he messed that whole plan up. Jeez. Yeah. Um, yeah, I it's interesting too the way that some writers over time have talked about their weddings specifically. Like there are some versions that make it sound like it was really really important to her to get married before she was 40. Uh-huh. It's like I don't get that vibe. Yeah. You and I were going to talk about the whistling boy. Yeah, so <laughs> um have reading through this before we recorded I was like I feel like I know this painting and I just couldn't bring it to mind so I googled it um and at wikimedia wikimedia commons which is a place you can find lots of usually public domain work there's this sentence that says this painting was originally titled the smoking boy Art censors at the time forced Frank Duvenek to paint out the cigarette in the boy's hand, leaving us with the painting, which now hangs in the Cincinnati Art Museum. So I was like, whoa, that's a thing to not, like, that seems like if that were the case, it would have been in the episode, because this painting comes up a few times. And then I didn't find any other source claiming that he had been forced to paint it out. And instead, I have found, uh, and I think you found also, sources that basically said that there was a varnish on the painting that had darkened and made it hard to see. And once that was removed, you could see that there was a cigarette in his hand. So I'm like, where did this whole thing come from about him being forced to paint it out? The other thing is, when I read that, I thought that the thing being discussed was that there had been a cigarette in his left hand that had been painted out because the way uh, this uh, this person is holding his hand in the picture, like the position of his hand seems like there could have been a cigarette mm. between his index finger and his, his middle finger. Um, 
but where it actually is is in the other hand entirely. And you can see it if you zoom, like it's a little hard to see at computer screen resolution, but if you zoom in on it, like it's obviously right there. Yeah. So I don't know where that whole thing came from about him being made to paint it out. (laughs) I have a theory. Okay. Now, it's possible someone out there is like, oh, I know exactly where, and I just have not come across it. But I wonder if part of it isn't because that first big exhibit that, like, popped off where he suddenly got famous, Mm -hmm. there isn't a catalog listing for it. Mm, and yeah. one of the things that I read, uh, which was by Mahanri Sharp Young, this was written in 1969, but that write-up mentions that, oddly, in the reviews of it, the Whistling Boy isn't mentioned, but only three of the paintings are. Mm-hmm. And so it's possible that either, maybe, they were like, we shouldn't even talk about this painting, it's a kid smoking, although that seems odd. Um mm-hmm. Or that someone has made the assumption that it was left out of discussion or that it was not part of the exhibition because of it. That's the trick, is that we don't know what all was in that. We know those three that we mentioned. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, it's guesswork. Sure. Um, Like, there's even a, a little confusion because one of the things that's mentioned, there are two notes mentioned, I think it's in Henry James's review, that it's all male subjects but then he describes a painting of a baby. And at that point, the only baby painting that anyone knows of that he had done was a little, very obviously, like a little girl in like classic Uh. little girl stuff. So it's a little unclear. Um, And I wonder if some of that confusion is what has led to this. But uh, as I mentioned, he really liked to lay shellac and varnish on because he thought it made his stuff look old and cool. (laughs) And I and that stuff yellows over time, and I think it had just obscured that detail because it's still there. It didn't get painted out. Oh, Frank Duvenek, mm-hmm. let's time travel and we'll go on a, a little drinking party together. He sounds so fun. Sounds so fun. What a, like I love the idea of this like boisterous, fun person who is not full of themselves because often that's how that works. Mm -hmm. But he's instead boisterous and fun and wants everybody to, like, be recognized for their work and praised and supported. I'm like, I love you. (laughs) Um, And if you do go to the Met, like I said, go see that that memorial sculpture. It's so beautiful. It is so beautiful. I love it. talked about oodles of noodles this week (laughs) (laughs) i feel like when i was a kid there was a ramen brand like an instant ramen that was called oodles of noodles there was i'm sure of it i don't know if it's still around um here we'll look it up uh while we do that we'll mention that the thing that i refrained from talking about in relation to the stroganoff family Mm -hmm. was their amazing art collection Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a tiny mention of it in the episode. Tiny. Yeah, but like they were famed for their art patronage and and lauded for it. Stroganoff. <laughs> mm-hmm. How I love it. Yeah. I love it so much. I want to make it all the time. Yeah, there was, um, that's one of those dishes that my mom made when we were kids for the the both ease and economy of making it. And I, we've talked about my many issues with food textures when I was a kid. Uh, I did not love the texture of egg noodles for some reason. I don't have this problem now. Yeah, but, um, but so she would serve that or something similar over like mashed potatoes or rice or uh, some other starch. That very inexpensive starch adding a component to it is part of like what makes it yeah, super More economical, easy. yeah. Super easy, easy and for families, yeah. yeah. Um, I really, really love, and we only touched on it briefly, um, uh, Alexander Grigorievich Stroganov, who was the one who anybody could walk into his house and eat. Mm-hmm. And I love that so much. And he mm-hmm. would have, like, I, th- I forget what the exact rules were. It was basically, like, you had to be smart like, you had to be interesting and be able to converse, and you had to 
be dressed decently, which didn't mean fancy. It was kind of like, you know, shirt and shirt and shoes required. Mm-hmm. Um, this is this isn't a beach vacation. Not that you would be at the beach in Odessa, but um, I love that idea of just anybody can come and eat. And my presumably very talented professional chefs will serve you like they would anyone else, mm-hmm. and we'll all just sit down and have a meal together. I'm like, oh, that sounds kind of amazing. It makes me like him heaps. Um, I also really, really love Luisa Tetrazzini. Everything yeah. I read about her is so fun. And she just sounds like she had a great time. Mm-hmm. Um, And I love that she was, I mean, I can't imagine being that self-confident from right out of the gate. But she mm-hmm. seems like she always was. The envy, I feel, for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where she just knew exactly who she was, what she was capable of, and what she was willing to put up with. Yeah. I'm not sure offhand if I have eaten a Tetrazzini. Like, everything in it. I'm like, yes, I'm on board with all of this. Uh, But it also seems like something I might have been more likely to eat in a restaurant. And... Maybe. And I like I think if I were in a restaurant that were serving it, there would probably be other things on the menu that would call to me more. Maybe, but don't sleep on Tetrazzini because it's real good. Yeah, it sounds I, delicious. Um, I forget where it was that I was in the research when someone mentioned that Vincent Price had included, loved it and included a recipe. And I was like, I have that book to yeah. the collection. And I got to open up my treasury of great recipes and look up their recipe, which is so very good. Charming. I love Yay. that it's like parentheses. <laughs> <laughs> Chicken and spaghetti casserole. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'll do my plug for that book again. If no one has read it, you can still get copies of it. It is Vincent and Mary, uh, who were both big foodies, uh, recreating with blessings the recipes from all of their favorite restaurants that they had visited around the world. So it's uh-huh. like, here's the section on this place we love in in Rome. Here's this section on this place we love in Paris. And it's um, it's really wonderful because... I mean, we've I've talked about Vincent Price on the show. I love him very much. Um, but the way that he really wanted to democratize art history for a lot of people, like he did the the art print collections in Sears so that people can mm-hmm. be exposed to great artists at almost any budget. He similarly wrote books like this. He wrote several cookbooks that were about like allegedly fancy food should not just be for wealthy people. Everyone should know and delight in like the delicious combinations that food can create. And I love him for that. Mm-hmm. I love him for many reasons. <laughs> but uh, if you get your hands on it. Also, he has, he and Mary put a um, a little trick for making roux in that cookbook that I live by, which is that they pre-make it in huge batches and then freeze it. And you just use like a melon baller to scoop out the right amount and you're ready to go. You put it in your skillet and you're ready to start adding other stuff to it. Yeah. Their recipe comes out velvety smooth every time. It's so good. Nice. So like their proportions are exactly correct. Yeah. Um, So highly recommend if you're a a home cook. My, um... My spouse's, I think, grandmother teaching him to cook told him, as long as you know how to make a roux, you'll never starve. That's correct. You'll never starve and everything will taste pretty good. Mm -hmm. Listen, a roux can correct a lot of problems. (laughs) Super simple, but it is easy, like, to get it wrong and it seizes up sometimes. And, Uh you know, when you add the... I literally fixed some not great tasting stuff while visiting my dad recently by making a a roux and then a Parmesan sauce out of it. And then, Ooh. Listen, did the pork get overcooked? Yes, it did. But the sauce was so good you wouldn't even notice. Nice. Nice. <laughs> uh, I love it. I feel like we're getting to a point kind of with eponymous foods. We're not there yet, but we're nearing it that you got to with nursery rhymes where it's like, we're going to reach the Running end Running out. Soon. Yeah. There are more, but some of it is like, if it's too obscure, I feel like it doesn't quite fit the bill because part of what's great is like, most people have heard of beef stroganoff. Most people have heard of Tetrazzini, even if they haven't had it. 
Uh, so that name recognition helps. There are yeah. a few more on the list that'll be there, but then there are some where it's like, you know, um, super obscure person you've never heard of, dish that's not very common. Yeah. It and doesn't I, work. I feel like you're probably having some of the same thing that I have had with nursery rhymes where it's like, I'm sure there are foods that are named for people that are incredibly well-known in like, just let's say China that haven't necessarily been exported yes. out of China. Yes, for sure. And like for us to try to find and talk about those, like we're going to miss a bunch of cultural nuance that would be important. As that's my, that's my imagina- imagination of uh, Yeah, of that. I mean, um, it came up a lot in this episode, right? Where it's like people, with Tetrazzini in particular, where people are claiming different years. And I can go back through newspaper records and go, nope, it's right here. Nope, it's right here. That's harder to do when you get to foreign language. <laughs> um, so we'll see. We'll see how often they come up again. But I love yeah. doing them, and they're, I always like to talk about food, so... Uh, oops all noodles mm-hmm. which is you know what that's a reference to right uh the oops all berries yeah yeah i yeah. discovered someone recently who had never heard of oops all berries which just in case there's anyone hearing this that is the version of captain crunch cereal where right, they right. only put crunch berries in it i love it but it sure does tear up the roof of my mouth <laughs> yeah <laughs> oops oops all noodles wouldn't do that to me yeah, I just Googled oodles of noodles to circle back to that. Me too. And I think the brand still exists, but doesn't really use the name anymore, maybe? I don't know. Don't know for sure. Yeah, I'm not sure either. Um, but there is a commercial from the 1970s. Yep, I see that, that in uh, my results. For it, and it looks very much, I'm not watching the commercial, but it looks very much like a ramen packet would. Yep. So yeah. I think your memory is 100% correct. Yeah, my um I think when I was in high school it was the first time that we ever had uh instant ramen and it was because um my mom had gotten uh like maybe not so far as a recipe but like a food idea from a friend that was making an almost uh faux like fondue with uh, Would that the, be a phone do? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was terrible. <laughs> I'm going to jail for that. Um, But, like, you would have the noodles and you would use the broth, like, the flavor packet part of the ramen, and you would get your vegetables and stuff in that. Um, It was really a lot like making instant ramen and putting a lot of vegetables in it, which is a thing I will still, like, dress up my instant ramen with. Uh, other ingredients. Oh, yeah. Listen, ramen satay is one of my favorites. Um, Here's a question. I don't know if I've ever asked you this before. Hi. Right. I know your, your parents were really, really intent on nutrition as a lesson for you and your brother. Did your mom do much prepackaged stuff or was it all pretty much from scratch? So when I was really little, everything was from scratch. Mom didn't even buy like, uh, pre-packaged baby food for us. There was a baby food grinder that, like, the food went in to be ground up to be suitable for babies. And after my brother was born, my mom was a stay-at-home mom for some years. And during those years, pretty much everything was made from scratch all the time. And any, um, like any fast food or any prepackaged whatever that we had was like some kind of special circumstance. Yeah. Um, eventually, my mom was like, if these kids are going to go to college, I got to get a job. <laughs> uh, and I'm just going to stress at this moment, what my mom did to send us both to college is not the amount of money it takes to go to college today. I am not at all suggesting that if mom and dad both has a job, you can afford to go to college. because no. That's not how it works anymore. Uh, but mom went back to work full time pretty much so that they would have enough money for my brother and me to be able to afford to go to college. And when that happened, there was a lot more like prepackaged stuff. And then as my mom became disabled, her disa- her disability meant that like a lot of stuff was more accessible if it was coming out of a jar or yeah, a box 100%. rather than being like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, my mom was very hardcore about everything had to be made from scratch. Uh-huh. And, like, by the way, as we have this discussion, also, 
There's no shame in the prepackaged game. I'm really not, no. No. no, I I love a made from scratch meal, but I also love. But because my mom was kind of militant about it, like she, I feel like that was her thing she could control. You know what I mean? Like sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it became like the dirty little secret of like my dad and I sneaking out to McDonald's on occasion. It was like, do not tell your mother. Uh, but <laughs> as a consequence, I think I had a period in life where I lived on my own and I embraced prepackaged things so much as a form of rebellion. Yeah. Now I'm kind of back to making more stuff from scratch. But also, like, I love a little doctored up anything. Mm -hmm. You can doctor up most prepackaged things to be pretty darn tasty if you have a little creativity. Um, Like I said, there is no shame in that game. If you're not a cook, I am not judging you. Yeah, I had a kind of similar... Mine was really sugary cereals. uh, (laughs) Because even after... uh, like, even as there was more prepackaged and prepared stuff as part of our lives, uh, no sugary cereals was just, like, a standard rule. And the only time we had sugary cereals was at one grandmother's house, who always had Fruit Loops. Uh, and when we would go on vacation, Mom would get those little, like, single-serve boxes that came with, like, a mix of different things. Uh, and then I got to college, and they had Lucky Charms on in the cafeteria every day. <laughs> yeah, literally on the little thing that you lifted up and the Lucky Charms yeah. came out. And that, like, I also was vegetarian. I, I, let me, I don't send me notes about the gelatin and the, and the marshmallows. I didn't know. Uh, but because I was not eating meat and there was always Lucky Charms, there was a lot of Lucky Charms in oh, my diet. Delicious. Delicious. You, you took me back instantly with the multi-packs of mini bags of cereal. Oh, yeah. And I'm like... Those poor sugar smacks that sat there forever because I never wanted those. The corn pops were our favorite. Oh, all the all the Apple Jacks. Uh-huh. Holy man, to this day I think about Apple Jacks and it's like a dopamine hit. Yeah. Um, but now I don't I don't enjoy sugar cereals as much just because like I don't feel great after I eat them. Yeah, um, we don't keep cereal getting older. The can't handle anymore. sugar the way yes. I used to. <laughs> <laughs> all right. If you uh, have some time off this weekend, I hope you eat something really delicious and that it does not in any way impact you negatively. (laughs) Uh, If you are not taking time off, I still hope you get something delicious wedged in there because, listen, yummy things are a great moment of joy that you can find in most days. Uh, We will be right back here tomorrow with a classic episode. And then on Monday, something brand new for you. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.